So I want to talk quickly about what to do with persistence. Now that we have two application servers, it doesn't make sense to have anything that persists data on just one. So for example, if a user uploads a file for their profile image or something like that, and you save it on server one, when they get bounced to server two, that image becomes a 404 response because the image doesn't exist on that server. So you have to save stuff to a central location. Now I'm actually gonna skip doing that. In other words, I'm not gonna go over the solution to save files to S3 or something like that. Instead, I'm gonna talk about the other stuff we persist database, and a cache system, Redis in my case. So similarly, like user uploaded data, it doesn't really make sense to have a database on one of the servers and your cache on one of the servers, because if one of the servers goes down or gets replaced, then your database or Redis cache is gone too. So you want that to be on a separate server, right? The idea of load balancing is to handle higher traffic, yes, but you also don't want to have one server with resources being used up by the database while the other server doesn't, because then you get into more complicated load balancing scenarios, although that is possible. But you also often have a case where you can replace and add and delete servers in and out of your load balancer rotation. So maybe you'll add a third server or fourth server when you get high traffic and remove those later. You don't necessarily want one with infrastructure that can't or shouldn't get deleted on a server that may or may not get created and destroyed at any point. So it makes sense to put your database and things that persist like data in your Redis cache on a different server or service. Now in AWS, I often use something like RDS or Elastic Cache for those services, so it's a hosted platform that you pay for, but you can also just make another server and put MySQL on there and maybe put Redis on that or another server here also. In my case, I'm gonna use a fourth server and install MySQL and Redis on both of these. So let's just go ahead and see what that process looks like so you have an idea of what it takes to put MySQL and Redis on a server that is separate from your application servers. So we'll head on over to my terminal. I'll log into the persistent server here. I've not installed anything on this yet, so it's a fresh server. So I'll do at get update, and after that, we'll install the server basics once again. And that'll be the usual git tmux vim curl wget zip unzip htop in my case. Okay, and now we have to decide what to install. So headed back to our application here, and we see this is back to our default Laravel screen. I am bouncing between the two servers, although it's hard to know here because it just gets the same response. We have to decide on a few things. The ultimate goal here is that I'm gonna try to get everything up and running and then do the Laravel scaffolding for authentication so that we can create a user and stay logged in. Now the staying logged in part is important because the default session storage within Laravel is the server storage. So that means if I log in when I'm on one server and then I get bounced to the next server on the next HTTP request, I won't be logged in anymore. And the reason for that is because a session storage is on one server and not the other. So you can do two things in that case. One, you can use cookie-based session data, where session data gets saved to the cookie, and therefore it's in the user's browser. But that has size limitations, and if you save a lot of stuff to your session, in other words, things like large validation rules or just generally stuff you want to save within requests but not necessarily persist to a database, then you run into limitations. So I generally set a session storage of my cache, my Redis cache usually. So I'm going to set the session storage to Redis. And then of course I can reuse Redis for an object cache as well to speed up my site. And then I'm going to put my SQL on a separate server as well like we discussed. So let's do those two things on the server. We know we need to install Redis and then install MySQL, which is what I'm gonna use in this case. So I already did an apt-get update, I'm gonna do apt-get install dash y redis server, and this will install redis. And redis will basically be set up after that. There's nothing fancy to do with it, unless you want it to persist to disk every few seconds. Okay, now, the database. I'm just gonna install the default MySQL server version that comes in Ubuntu 16.04, which is a flavor of 5.7. You can set a Password for the root user, of course, something very secure. I'm just using root because this is a server I'll kill after this video series. Now we do have to do some stuff to allow our servers to make remote connections to Redis and MySQL. So let's head to Etsy, Redis, and we'll see what we have here. So I'm gonna edit the main Redis config, redis.conf. Search for the word flush. What we see here is that by default, this is actually flushing to disk every second, so that is actually gonna persist some data, so that's great. Let's search for the word bind, and we can see that this is only binding to the localhost IP address, and we don't really want that. We want this to bind to a network that it can listen on for remote connections. Now, I'm gonna quit this without making any changes. I'm gonna do the if config command, and we'll see we have two networks here. 
the loopback localhost network on our server here. And then we have F0, which is our private network. So I'm just gonna copy and paste our private network IP address. We'll uh, edit the redis.conf file and we'll find bind again. And in addition to localhost, we're gonna bind to this IP address. In other words, our local private network that AWS sets up for us. So what I'm doing here is setting up redis to allow connections from localhost and our local network, which is on uh, F0, which is the name of the network interface for our private network here. So any server inside of this local network is gonna be able to connect to this Redis server over the private network. Okay, so we can restart Redis after that to suck in those changes, and we'll do the same for MySQL. All right, so MySQL 5.7 has a few configuration files. Let's just find the right one. I think it's inside of mysql.conf.d, and let's see, mysql.d.conf should be it. It is, okay. So bind address, same story here. Instead of localhost 127.001, we're gonna let it bind to the private network IP address. Now, because this also opens up a local Unix socket, we can still connect to MySQL locally in addition to over the private network. So I'll save and quit this. MySQL right now can be connected to like this. And when I don't define a host, it's just connected over the local socket. And then I can do host 127001, which is not over the local uh, Unix socket. Instead, this is over the local bind address that is configured that we saw that we just changed, but I haven't restarted my SQL yet, so that change hasn't gotten sucked in. This will also work, and it did. Now, if I do sudo service my SQL restart, it'll suck in that change to bind to the local private network. And I can do the same thing again. So my SQL like this will still work because it's connecting to the local Unix socket, but the connection over the IP 127.001 will no longer work because the server's not listening on that anymore. But if I check out the local network here, the local private network where I've bound it to, I can connect that way. Okay, so it did work, but I'm not allowed to connect to it because I haven't created a user that can connect from this IP address yet. So this is another layer of my SQL security. So that doesn't really matter. I'll never actually connect to this network when I'm on the local network for my SQL, but I am going to connect from my two application servers. So let's see, my application servers are IP address 17231 and something, and 17231 and some other stuff. So. I can set up a user that can be connected to from those remote users. So I'll do my SQL, login as root. And the first thing I'll do is create database, my app, giving it a default care set of UTF-8 MB4, and then we can create a user that can connect to this database. So create user, my user, at, and in quotes here, we're gonna do 172.31, right? Those are the IP addresses here, 172.31 for both application servers, and then I'll do dot and a wildcard. So I'm saying basically any server that is in the 17231 IP address range of my local private network can connect using this user that I'm creating named my user. And it'll say identified by some password that should be secure, but I'm just gonna set a secret here. Okay, so now we'll grant all privileges on the database, my app, and every table inside of it to the user we just created, and I'll just copy and paste that. So the syntax here is we can grant specific privileges. I'm gonna do all privileges. I'm gonna grant all privileges to the user I just created, specifically connecting when this from this IP address, and I'm gonna give it access to the My App database and every table inside of it. And we'll flush privileges when we're done with that, and we can test that out, see if we can connect there. So let's log into an application server. See if we have my SQL client. I don't think we do, so we'll install that quick. We just want the client in this case, not the server. All right, then we do my SQL dash H, and we will grab that private network IP address, and we're gonna say the user is my user, and I'm gonna say the password will be secret, and we're in. Now, if I do show databases, we can see that my app exists. I can use my app. I can show tables. There's no tables in it yet, of course, but we are basically all set. I can connect to that server from my application server and from both application servers because they're both in this IP address range that we set and allowed that user to connect from. Okay, so I'm gonna exit here. I'm gonna create a second screen and I'm gonna log into both my application servers. 
And within these, we can head to var, dub dub, my app. And we need to edit the .m file. And we need to change all this stuff. So our server here is going to connect over the private network IP address. We're going to connect to my SQL at that address. We know the database is my app. The username is my user. The password is the super secret password of secret. And then we set the Redis stuff as well. So cache driver is Redis. Session driver should now also be Redis. Redis host is going to be that same IP address. And those are the only changes we need to make. And we can do the same changes under here. OK, now I'm going to close this out. And back over here, I'm going to do sudo u www data, because that's the owner of the PHP files. And we'll do php artisan make auth to get that scaffolding. And then I'll do php artisan migrate. I'll also run that in case it needs to write to a log file as www data. And this got tables created successfully. So we know that this is now connecting to the MySQL server successfully because it was able to connect to it and run the migrations. Let's exit that. And I just need to log back into this server and head to var dub dub my app. And I'll do sudo dash u dub dub data php artisan make auth. I just want these two servers to have the same scaffolding and everything set up. I don't need to migrate here, of course, because we already migrated on the other server and there's only one database to migrate to. OK, so let's do this. I'll refresh. We don't have Predis. That's another thing I forgot. So to get that, I'll keep running as www.data because we're writing new files into the my app directory, which is owned by user www.data. We'll do composer require Predis slash Predis. And I'll do the exact same thing on the other server without showing you because it's boring watching me do the same exact command on two servers. And that's done. Let's head on over here and refresh. We should get Laravel and we see the login and register. And I'm refreshing. I'm bouncing between the two servers and it's working. So let's log in. And actually, I need to register. And I'll just register here. And great, I'm logged in. Now I can refresh this. And as I refresh, I get bounced between the two servers. And I stay logged in because we have that central session storage of Redis. I can log back out. I'm logged out in both servers. And I should be able to log back in as well. Great, and I'm all set. OK, so we did a few things here. One, we logged into our persistence server. We installed MySQL. We installed Redis. And then we bound both Redis and MySQL to that server's private network. So if you do if config over here, we see the private network address of our persistent server is the 172.31.356. That is what Redis and MySQL are both connecting to. We saw that Redis and MySQL are binding to this address so that it gets set to the F0 network interface and therefore listens over the private network so our other servers within that private network can connect there. So we're pretty much all set here. We've set up our servers. We set up our load balancer. We set up our application servers and made sure the code can accept and adjust request options based on the exported headers to correctly identify client information and generate correct URIs and have the correct client IP address. And then we set up our persistence to have MySQL and Redis in a central location so that we don't get the split brain issue of having our two applications on two different servers with two different databases or two different caches or two different session storages. In the next video, I'm just going to cover some security concerns where we set up a firewall to properly protect our servers because right now each of these servers has rules saying that they can accept any connection from any port from any source, and we want to lock that down. This won't be common to AWS users, but this might be more common to users of things like Linode and DigitalOcean and those kind of hosting providers.